Selena May, the online pastor at World Harvest Church in Enid, Oklahoma. You're about to hear a spirit-filled message from our pastor. So grab your Bible, and if you're a coffee lover like me, grab a cup of coffee and get ready for a personal word that God has for you today. I want you to grab your Bible, grab your device. Let's prepare to get into the Word of God today. I believe the Lord has something He wants to speak to each and every one of us. So let's pray once again. Father, now as we enter into this time of the teaching of your Word, Lord, we do thank you so much for all you have done and all you are doing, Lord God. And Lord, I thank you that you are here today to encounter us. So Lord, we thank you that you're alive and well and we do long for more of you in our lives and less of us. So Lord, as I begin to bring this message today here for these next few moments we have remaining, Lord, speak something powerful to each one. In your name we pray, amen and amen. We're in a series entitled Real Encounters. How many of you know Jesus is real today? Is Jesus real to anybody here today? Whenever we encounter a real Jesus, something's gonna change, something is gonna happen it's in this series, those just with us last week, we had a great testimony from Wanda Walker, how the Lord encountered her, brought healing to her body. But before I get into what the Lord has for us in the message today, we have another testimonial video that I wanna play today from one of our ladies here at the church where life happened and where Jesus showed up. So turn your eyes to the screens and let's watch this before I... About two years ago, my husband of 28 years and at that point two months was diagnosed with MDS. It's a pre-leukemia and so we started that journey um, of him going to get a bone marrow transplant. It kind of got derailed along the way as to our plans and we wound up in the hospital and he didn't make it back out of the hospital. But all along the way there were people no matter how difficult it got at each step of the journey, even on the very last day, August 3rd, that we had to let David go be with Jesus, God provided shelter every step of the way. Whether it was in the form of me standing in line to get my lunch and a nurse behind me pays for my meal, to people coming by, and because it was a financial struggle because David wasn't working, he was in ICU. and. Um, and he's our only income because I was a stay-at-home homeschooling mom. People would come and they would come to see David and they would leave and they would do the whole, I, I know we're not Baptists, but it was like the Baptist handshake. And when they would pull their hand away, they would leave 200 bucks in the hand. During the whole almost three months that we had zero income, not one single bill went unpaid. God took care, and I don't even know how. Some of them I remember how, but some of it, I don't even remember how it got taken care of. But it all got paid. And those things ministered to me that those were my safe places that God was providing along that journey. Those were, you know, my encounters with God. And God was there. I would cry out, Dear Lord, in the Bible, you promised that you draw near to the brokenhearted. I need you to draw near to me. And He does. You wake up, and how can God not be there when your first words out of your mouth that morning are, Lord, please help me. Please help me to find joy today. Please draw near to me because my heart is just broken. Because sometimes you wake up in the morning, you're crying just because you wake up and he's not there, you know, and your heart is just totally crushed. But God is good, especially in the bad. That's been my saying this whole time. God is good, especially in the bad. We live in a big three-story house that was not affordable without David's income. So I just started praying, Lord, help us. I don't know where we're going. I've got, at that point, I had three kids still at home, and I had two that lived in my backyard apartment. And so I just kept praying. And so I'm looking, and everything that I found was just not, but God provides those safe places for you. And He did. A little tiny fixer-upper in Wachomis. He always comes through. I mean, you know, even though you're going through the worst thing you could ever imagine in your entire life, God is there every step of the way. We've had, they had several work days with the men from the church. They came and ripped out the whole bathroom. They ended up ripping out a wall. They've done new windows, new floors, you name it, they've done it. Our church, they are taking a real Jesus to a real world. Without them, we would not be where we are today. And the house is not only livable, it's precious. It's just a testimony to God's faithfulness. He's brought us so far and he's been there every step of the way that I don't know what the future holds, 
but I know he's gonna be right there with us and he's gonna direct our paths because he's done that this whole way. I know he's gonna be with me every step of the way. There's gonna be God encounters and I'm so thankful. I can't imagine walking this path without God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lisa. Tell us a story. I love what Lisa talked about that house in Wacoma. It's just, it's the house that love built. And so I love that. Encounter Jesus. Well, open your Bibles with me here, the book of Acts, chapter 2. And really, here in just a few moments that I have remaining in the service, there's something just stirring on my heart that I just want to unpack to you here today just to look at your life maybe in a different way here today. We're talking about real encounters with the real, in Je- with the real Jesus, having that moment of encounter with him. You know, you may have felt forgotten this week, but let me tell you something. You're not forgotten, amen? Jesus is here. He's been with you. I can guarantee you that. You're, and I want you to know today, you're not a loser, you're a winner. Come on, you're more than a conqueror in this place today. And I want us to look at something. I have not been able to get away from the beginning of the church that we read about in Acts chapter two. For the last many weeks, uh, we visited this passage of scripture many times, but there was something that just really went off in my spirit this week that I wanna just speak into. If you look with me again in verse 42, and then if you've been coming for the last several weeks and been listening to me online You've uh, you've heard me talk about how the church began after uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2 and just what began to take place. And picking it up in verse 42 again, it says this, and all the believers, they devoted themselves, and again, this is not my focus today, but to four things, to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Come on, how many of you know prayer is important? Prayer is important. Man, we have an, had an incredible prayer night Friday evening here, a prayer intensive. Man, God moved. It was very powerful. Verse 43, this is what I want us to see. Now, this is out of the New Living Translation, and it says this, and a deep, come on, read these first five words with me, and a deep sense of, of what? Of awe came over them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Now, let me ask every one of us a question here today. Can God still perform miraculous signs and wonders today? Do do, do you believe that God can and will still heal today? Does anybody in this church believe that with me? Now, I don't have time to dig back in. We talked about that last week, and I made this statement that I'd rather go to my grave believing and trusting in God that he can and never see another person healed again than live my life thinking that he can't. I believe that he can. Amen? I believe he can. Now, listen to me. I believe, though, that over the last several weeks that we've talked about this passage of Scripture, we have missed something. Because yes, the disciples were committed to those four areas, the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, to prayer. They were committed to those four things, but something happened in the early church that I believe we're missing today in the church in America. Now, I'm not specifically talking about World Harvest Church, but after those four things were committed to, do you remember what it said that happened in the church? It said that a deep sense of awe of awe. Now, if you study that word, it means a reverential fear, the fear of God. The people had a fear of God. Church, I dare to say today that in America, we have lost our fear of God in our churches, in our life today. We have become so familiar with God that we've lost the value for him. And I don't know what has brought you to church here today or you're tuning in online right now, but church, I believe that we are entering a time in this pandemic, in this time where the world has absolutely gone crazy. Instead of getting involved in the mess of the craziness, we need to pull ourselves up and we need to draw closer to Jesus in our lives. Because I believe that Jesus, he is the answer to every problem that we've got in our society. He's the answer to your issues. He's the answer to my issues. And I believe we need to draw close to him. You know, we're in this season in the natural coming into this fall season that everybody that grew a garden right now, you're reaping the harvest of that. Any gardeners here in their church today? 
Any gardeners? You know, I, when I grew up in Guyman, I was out in Guyman, Oklahoma for many years before Tammy and I moved here to start this church over 32 years or 22 years ago. And it was not uncommon when we lived in Guyman and go into a church service, when we would come out of a church service, especially this time of year, it was not uncommon for us to find a bag of produce sitting in our front seat. Whether it was green beans, it was squash, cucumbers, whatever it was. And it's the idea, the Lord just reminded of this, that what you cultivate, you get to reap the benefits of. Those of you that are gardeners, if you've cultivated your garden properly, what are you doing right now? You're reaping the benefits of that, amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It, 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 to cultivate, this is a key word for us here today. Cultivate means this, it means to, to nurture, to foster, it means also to tend, to nurture, to foster, to tend. Now, pastor, what are you talking about? Gardening today? No, but I'm talking about this, that in the early church, there was a culture that was cultivated in that church that caused the power of God to flow, that caused blind eyes to open, that caused the lame to walk, that caused marriages to be healed, that caused people to lay off the hurts and the habits and the hangups of life. Come on, does it sound like we need that today in our world? Amen. So there was a culture that was cultivated that caused, I believe, listen to me, the presence of God to manifest mightily in their lives. Now, is there anybody here today that you need the presence of God to manifest in your life, anywhere at all? Is there anybody here with me besides Brad Mendenhall and Tammy Mendenhall today? You need the presence of God. I wanna talk to you here for just a couple of moments. How do we cultivate the presence of God? Because I could stand up here and tell you how to cultivate a garden, I can tell you how to grow green beans or okra. But when it comes to the presence of God, there are many times that we just want God to show up and show off in our lives, and I love it when he does that. But I also believe that we are uh, in our lives that we should do something and we can do something to help to cultivate the presence of God. Last week, I made this statement. There's a difference between the omnipresence of God and the tangible presence of God. What is the omnipresence? The omnipresence of God, it's that promise we find in Hebrews where he says that he never leaves us and he never forsakes us. Come on, how many of y'all are glad Jesus never leaves us and he never forsakes us today? In this crazy world, no matter what kind of week you've had this week, he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. But that's the omnipresence of God. There's a difference though because see, I've learned this as a husband. I don't know if there's any other husbands that have learned this in your life. There's a difference between being present and being engaged in the relationship. I, I am notorious whenever I get in the car to go for a trip. Now, I don't do this so much as I used to, but I, we'd get to the end of that trip and Tammy would look at me and say, you know what? I have done all the talking and you have sit there and not engaged me one bit. Any other husbands have that conversation before that you want to admit it? I see your arms poking husbands all over the church right now. So, In other words, I can be present with her in the car, but I can, I've learned this. I can be present but not engaged in the relationship. I mean, in fact, she's gotten to the point that if I'm not engaging, she'll stop and say, you know what, I am not saying another word until you engage the conversation. Am I the only one that's been through that? <laughs> Come on, there's a difference between being present and being engaged. I want you to know that. I believe it's the same way with our Lord and Savior. There's a difference between him just being present in our life and us being engaged into the relationship. Anybody with me here today? So I'm talking about here today, how do we cultivate the presence of God? This is just a couple thoughts I wanna drop in your heart today. Number one is this, we should start by living a God-centered life. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you gotta live a God-centered life. You know, when you look at your life right now and all the craziness that's going on all around us, where does God fit into all of it? When you look at your past week, when you look at the way you've lived your life, when you look at the way you've dealt with COVID over this last week, when you look at the way you've dealt you parents with school this week, when you look at the way you've dealt with business, where has God fit into it all? See, it seems that so many people are struggling not right now when it comes to dealing with the things of the world. 
Because we can deal with things of the world, yes, and we have to do that thing, but we can tend to push God off to the side. We can tend to not give God attention in our world. And it's very easy in this messed up, crazy world to allow the mess to mess with us. If all you listen to is the news, if all you're getting is the world's news around you, let me tell you, you're gonna live in fear. But how many of you know we live by faith and not by fear? You can correlate your level of faith that you're living in to what you've been putting into your life this week. What are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you putting inside of you? See, this is what I know our heart, our inner, I'm not talking about your blood pumping muscle here, but I'm talking about your internal being. It's like an oil filter. Now, every guy in this church knows that every so many thousands of miles, you gotta change your oil filter. Why do you have to change your oil filter, guys? Because it gets crudded up. It gets gunked up. I, I ran across this picture on the internet of a gunked up oil filter. How many of y'all know that is a gunked up? It, that is messed up. I don't know. That was not out of my car. That may have been out of one of y'all's cars. <laughs> but let me tell you, church, there's a lot of Christians whose heart looks like this. Because of the gunk that they're allowing in their life. Come on, look at your name and tell them, get the gunk out. <laughs> we gotta get the gunk. I want you to see something David said in Psalms chapter 51. King David, Psalms chapter 51 and verse 10. New King James says this, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 11, do not cast, listen to this, do not cast me away from your, help me out, what? Your presence and do not take your, Holy Spirit, for me, it seems to me as I read the scripture that David is correlating the cleanliness of his heart to the ability to encounter the Lord's presence. Does anybody else see that? His heart's crying his prayer, Lord, create in me a clean heart. He didn't stop there. Create a clean heart in me, why? So that I can experience your presence and the Holy Spirit in my life. Wow, where is that attitude today in our lives? Where is that attitude in the American church today? Creating me a clean heart, Lord Jesus. I believe if we want to encounter the presence of God that we need to work on the inside. Anybody else with me here in this church today? Let me read you a couple passages of scripture that the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. Listen to this. I don't have time to read this whole passage. It's a great passage, but he says this. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? You see that? This is, this is Bible, this is not me. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually part of Christ? Question mark. Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? He says what? Help, help me out. Never, no way. Uh, 16 and 17 are great scriptures, but let me jump down to verse 18. Verse 18, jump down to verse 18. He says this, 18, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against what? Against your body. Verse 19, don't you realize, everybody read it with me, that your body is what? Temple of the Holy Now, we quote that scripture many times, that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on, where does the Holy Spirit dwell today? Come on, everybody take your hand, place it up on your heart. But now keep it in context here. He's just not saying generally your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, but he's talking about our conduct, the way we should our light of our life. And he's really bringing some correction here. He's bringing some correction to our hearts here. And he's saying here, don't you know that your, the, 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 your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by Christ? He goes on and says, you don't belong to yourself. How many of y'all love Jesus today? And you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Let me hear you today. Paul's saying you don't belong to yourself. I, you may not want to get too excited about living for Jesus. Because our life is not our own when we walk with Jesus. Am I free to do what I want to do in this life? Absolutely not. He says you don't belong to yourself. Verse 20, for God bought you with a, come on, everybody say it with me, a high price. Ooh, so listen to what he says. You must honor God with what? Your spirit side, your spirit nature? With your what? With your what? With your body. Wow. He says here, honor God with your body, with what we do. 
If our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, let me ask you this, what kind of home have we made for him? Wow, that's a hard thought. This is what I've learned in my marriage. It took me a while to learn it. Guys, I'm a little slow, but I'm worth waiting on. If we go to a hotel, now it used to be, okay, because we don't see it now. If we go to a hotel and somebody's been smoking in it, guess what? We're not staying in the hotel. Tammy says, I ain't staying. I remember several years ago, we went to a hotel room and it smelled like cats peed all over in the hotel room. And I'm like, you know what? I'm a guy. I can take anything. Tammy says, I ain't no guy. I'm not doing it. We had to change hotel rooms. Come on, any ladies with me today? I mean, if we're gonna go spend money for a hotel room, we want the thing clean, right? And if it's not clean, if it doesn't smell good, we ain't staying. Now, if we're on a guy's trip, man, we can stink and we'll make it all right. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to my marriage, we, it's got to be clean. Is your life like that? What, what is your life? Is, is, is your life, is your home, is your marriage, is our church, is it a place that glorifies God that when the Holy Spirit drops in there, you're like, ah, oh, this is awesome. Or is it like a, the room of a teenager? Stuff cluttered everywhere. Three-week-old peanut butter and jelly sandwich is stuck under the bed. Crumbs everywhere. Anybody, you know what I'm talking about today. Maybe y'all didn't experience that as parents. I want you to see something else Paul said in Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four, he said this, throw off your old, net, old sinful nature. He said your formal way, this is verse 22 of Ephesians chapter four. Your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Verse 23, instead, oh God, let the Spirit, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Verse 24, put on your new nature that's created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Come on, say, I'm gonna put on the new nature. If you jump down with me to verse 29, there's several of those verses, but for sake of time, I'm gonna jump down to verse 29. Verse 29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Verse 30, key verse. Now church, this is a hard verse. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Uh, other translations, King James, older translations will say, Let, grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. So let me ask the question again. Does our conduct and life have anything to do with the presence of God manifesting in our life? Anybody? I believe it does. Because as I look through these scriptures here, this tells me that the way I live my life correlates with how God's presence is gonna show up. Let me finish this out. He says, remember, remember he has identified you as his what? As his own, as his own. It goes on in verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Verse 32, instead, what does he say? Be kind to each other, be tenderhearted, forgive one another. Anybody had any opportunity to forgive somebody this week? I think in today's culture, we seem to have lost the sense of living a holy life. I believe when we live a God-centered life, we get place for God's spirit to dwell. God's spirit to dwell. We've got to live a God-centered life. But number two, let me just, as I close this message, I believe also we've got to, got to practice his presence. Practice the presence of God. Remember what the scripture said back there in Acts chapter two that I read a few moments ago. It said a deep sense of what? Of awe fell over them all. Where's the awe of today for God? I said it a moment ago, and I wanna say it again. Have we become so familiar with God that there's no reverence for him in his presence? That awe, that fear means a reverential respect. Church, I believe we need to cultivate it. We need to stir it up in our life. I believe the Holy Spirit is looking for a place to land. 
And this is what I know. It's our inner strength that will determine our outward power in our lives. See, now don't get me wrong. Salvation is God's gracious free gift to us all. And it's not by works that we're saved. I'm not talking about salvation today. But I'm talking about experiencing his presence, engaging his presence. Because I believe that the power of God is based on the condition of our heart. How do we practice his presence? How do we practice his presence? Y'all remember the story in the Bible where Jesus began his earthly ministry and he was baptized in the River Jordan? Y'all remember the story and it says that the Holy Spirit came upon him like a what? Y'all remember that story? It says the Holy Spirit came down on him like a dove. And now the thing about it is, I want you to understand, is that it didn't leave him. Jesus then was empowered to go about into the world to do the ministry that he was called to do. Church, what else am I talking about? I'm talking about engaging the presence of God. Now let me just ask you a question. Because we talk about the condition of our heart. We talk about the Holy Spirit, not just his omnipresence, but being engaged into his tangible presence. This, this is kind of a crude example, but just think of the, the essence of the Holy Spirit being like a dove. If, if I've got this handkerchief on my shoulder, really, if I could just go along with me in this to represent just the Holy Spirit or God's presence on my life, how would I walk through my days of the week? How, 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 how would I live my life? How would I have my conversations? How, how would I treat my wife? Anybody? How would I do? I, I, I would do the things that I did and interact in life with the sense of his presence upon me. Anybody with me? This is what I'm saying, church, to cultivate the presence of God. If we will live a God-centered life and work on this thing and remember, now it's easy in a setting like this to say, yes, God, your presence is with me. It's easy. But my challenge is this, for us to really encounter the Lord outside of a Sunday morning service, we need to be aware In other words, the answer to my question, how would I live my life? I would live my life conscious of this. I would be careful what I had to say to other people. This is what I learned. I cannot afford to get upset with people anymore. I can't afford to carry a grudge anymore. If I do, what happens? I tell you, now don't get me wrong, the Lord doesn't forget us. But I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about his tangible presence. I don't know about you, but I want the tangible presence of God more. I need him more. You say, well, pastor, you live a pretty protected life. (laughs) Oh, really? You're a preacher. You're in the word all the time. Oh, really? Listen, we've had so much heartache We've had people desert us. We've been betrayed. We've had heartache. We've had pain, just like everybody else. So this is something for us all today. So here, just in closing, I want us just to go ahead and stand to our feet. Kinsley, are you back there? Yeah, come here. Don't rush out of here, because I just want us to spend just a moment, just a moment, quieting our minds, I want us to spend just a moment, not just in the car with Jesus, but I want us to spend just a moment engaging him. What does that look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. It's quieting our heart, quieting our head, and just looking to him. Some of y'all had a crazy week. Some of y'all was mistreated this week. Some of y'all experienced some hell this week. I want you to engage with the Lord. Will you do that? Come on, all across this sanctuary, I just want you to, whatever it is, if you want to kneel, if you want to come to the front, if you want to just stay right there, I'm just going to ask our team just to, just to, for this few moments, just to take us into the presence. Is all my hope is
much, how passionate are you to have a tangible sense of presence of God in your life? See, I can preach a message like this and talk about how we need the presence of God. We can talk about how that early church, that all just swept the congregation of that time. But bottom line is this, church, I'm going to just speak this got to have a hunger for it. You've got to have a desire for it. See right now, there's some of y'all that are in the sanctuary right now. You've got a hunger for more of the Lord. And there's other of you, I'll just say it, just like, well, that sounds good, but I'm ready to go. My prayer is this, that the Lord begins to stir in every one of us today a greater hunger for his presence. Father, in fact, right now, I just speak that over this congregation right now, Lord God. Father, a hunger, a desire to go deeper, a a hunger, a desire to encounter you, a hunger and a desire just to feel you in our lives, to go to that next step. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I'm going to ask prayer team if you'd come at this time. Now, I know for some, this may be kind of a heavy message today, but I couldn't escape it. The Lord is stirring this in my heart so heavy this week. So I know that it's a word in season for many today. It's a word in season for me and my life. And that prayer that that David prayed, Lord created in me a clean heart. That's a prayer that we all gotta pray. I could lead us in that prayer, For some, you'd mean it, but for others, it was just be words. So instead of saying that prayer, I was together. I'm going to challenge you when you're ready to pray that prayer sometime today. Lord, create a clean heart in me. Now, for some, it's going to be a matter of you have to repent from some stuff. Lord, I'm sorry for allowing all this junk in my life. My body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And under the Holy Spirit, I've grieved you. I've sorrowed you because of things I've looked at this week, because of things I've said this week, because of the hurt and the uh, and offense that I carry this week. Some of y'all have done that. You may need to repent. But I challenge us all, engage the presence of God this week and watch how your life changes in a special way. Thanks again for listening. We hope that this message inspires, challenges, and fuels you up to take a real Jesus to a real world. If you'd like to connect with us in any way, please go to harvestinid.com slash connect. Or if you'd like to learn more about us as a church, please go and check us out at harvestinid.com. We can't wait to share another message with you next week.